Okay, so first of all, I apologise, I'm an ecologist. Um, so I feel a bit of an imposter, and I'm probably going to say some crashingly naive things about social science, but, you know, just be gentle with me. Um, I want to give you an ecologist view of why we need social science to solve the biodiversity crisis, and you can all correct me afterwards about where I've got it wrong. But actually, I've also put up here uh, the front cover of the niche, which is the British Ecological Society's magazine, and this is the most recent edition. Um, so how do we make biodiversity mainstream? So, you know, this is uh, an issue that is um, occupying a lot of ecologists. And I don't need to tell you, I can see for a start on your, the poster behind me that, of course, we're well aware we're in a nature crisis, we're also in a climate crisis. Uh, yeah, common is becoming rare, rare is facing extinction. But also there's a, a crisis in uh, basically environmental justice, and we've got here maps on the left for green space deprivation, and a map on the right for high COVID incidents at, at, at one point during the epidemic. Uh, this, isn't, this is obviously just a correlation, but you know the COVID epidemic uh, really uh, um, made people acutely aware, actually, of the in inequities in access to green space and actually how much we need it. So um, there is, you know, a uh, at least three crises. Uh, on, on the books, uh, the nature crisis, the climate crisis, and unequal access to nature. And, of course, these are not independent. Um, we really need to sort of bring them together uh, and work on solutions that tackle all three of those crises, all three of those big problems at once. And I think this is where, you know, access uh, can have a really important impact. I'd also like to draw in um, our, our sister program here, um, which is actually a partnership between University of Exeter and the National Trust. And many of you probably know about this, this program, the Renew program, which is actually focused on, the, on biodiversity decline, but through using a people-in-nature approach. So it's really about how do we put people at the centre of action <laughs> on biodiversity renewal. It's a five years in the first instance, um, uh, but then there, is, there are also uh, indications that there will be follow-on from this. So, uh, you know, this puts Exeter, University of Exeter, in a really excellent position, I think, to advance some of these issues. So just to give you a little bit of background to Renew, uh, what... What knowledge gaps does it aim to address? So this, these are really essentially, we know, we know quite a lot ecologically about how to restore nature, about how to go about restoring habitats. Quite often, though, that information is sort of drawn from small-scale interventions and not really being translated or scaled up uh, to landscapes, which is the scale at which we really need to act. But actually, much less is known about behaviour change, about how to effectively influence individuals, communities, businesses, and land managers, actually, to deliver nature-positive actions. And even less is actually known about how to do this in ways that are really genuinely uh, going to address uh, the inequities in access to green space at the moment. And so uh, in Renew, we've kind of created a, a theory of uh, change, and this is part of that. It's identification of some of the barriers we see to biodiversity renewal. And you can see that in, in, in each of these cases, uh, it's very much a blend of ecology and social science. It's uh, the role of people's relationships with nature. It's about community decision-making. It's about how you can really integrate biodiversity into decision making and really work across those disciplines. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of, uh, co you know, many common areas of interest between these two programs. And to give you a little bit about the structure uh, of Renew, it has um, four kind of central themes, which are really focused around behaviour change for individuals, for communities for land managers and for business and finance. 
Um, and if you, if you visit our, our website, you can dig in a little bit more to what we're doing in each of those themes. And we have three supporting mechanisms. Uh, one is around environmental intelligence, so that's some of the technical stuff we need to do behind delivering a biodiversity dashboard that is really um, user-friendly to really, uh, help people make nature-friendly decisions. The second one is X Cases, which is led by Matt, who's here today, so he can tell you more about that. But that's actually trying to look at short sprints where we focus on very specific issues where we think we can make some progress through either a focused piece of analysis or a literature review or a very short um, study. And these are kind of tangential and complementary to the main research themes in Renew. And then thirdly, we actually have uh, a, a set of people who are actually studying how effectively uh, or not uh, we work across the disciplines, but not just across the academic disciplines. This is a partnership with the National Trust, so it's really trying to draw science into frontline delivery and solve you know, some of the challenges uh, that we, um, we, we meet in doing that. So what's National Trust doing involved in all this, you probably think? Don't, aren't we just about, you know, historic houses and, you know, okay, maybe a few gardens and parks <coughs> as well? Um, well, actually, we own also 780 miles of coast, uh, 260,000 hectares of land. That's about 1.5% of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, most of that, or much of that, is farmed, which raises, you know, particular issues, challenges and opportunities. Of course, you're saying what we're really known for are the four and a half million cups of tea that we serve every year. <laughs> but actually, in 2019, we also became an independent research organisation. Um, that was just after I joined and about the time Matt joined. And we, we are building up research capability within the Trust. And we now have a research strategy um, and here we have uh, kind of three blocks of themes. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, part of our USP is that we're sort of really blending, uh, connecting people with nature and heritage um, across the disciplines. And the theme that I'm at m most focused on uh, is the delivering multiple benefits from land and ecosystem planning, monitoring, evaluation. Hi guys. So glad I chose to walk. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, also something else that we can really offer in the trust is we spend about a hundred million pounds a year on uh, on conservation interventions in the landscape. And we're really uh, interested in, in turning some of these interventions into real-world laboratories, so really putting a, a framework around them so that we can really evidence what works as a result. And this is actually the basis of a strategic partnership that we now have with the University of Exeter. So... Um, and in fact, this is, re this is really pertinent now to a conversation I was having with you, Clive, earlier this morning, that um, in, in the um, National Trust we've been thinking about where we can have most impact. Very major challenge in terms of reversing um, biodiversity decline. Um, you know, are we going to, as Clive said this morning, spread the jam thinly, or are we going to put a few dollops in a few places? And Matt uh, led this piece of work where we actually drew together spatially, uh, more than 40 spatially explicit data sets um, across England, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, and included you know, specific data sets we have on our estate to really look at where we have the biggest opportunities um, for nature uplift. Uh, and then you can set some rules. For example, don't plant trees on peat soils, just, to, just as an example. Um, and then you can draw these, uh, interrogate these data to see where the big opportunities um, lie. And then we do a bit of ground truthing, integrating with local teams at um, properties in regions. 
And in doing that, we actually arrived at... Ignore those purple boxes for a while. Um, we arrived at 17 um, places where we think we can make very significant change, and we're calling them our nature accelerators. And each of those places is now drawing up a, um, a detailed plan uh, of, uh, what they, of their nature vision. And this, on the left, is actually an example of one of those plans. That's Wallington up in the north. So they have plans to, to um, uh, restore more than 1,000 hectares of priority habitat, plant a million trees, reintroduce certain key species, for example. So we're now really working with those places to really refine those plans, actually push their ambition, because this is still insufficient, really, um, and work out how we're actually going to fund and deliver those plans. So it's really kind of large-scale action on the ground. So what I've talked about here, really, is um, you know, uh, uh, how nat National Trust kind of fits into this picture. And I've really talked to you about that, the middle and the bottom of this triangle, about building blocks and KPIs we have on our land in our organization and how we actually want to monitor the effectiveness of our large-scale interventions. But I also want to mention that very top layer. I mean, if we are really going to uh, uh, reverse or halt declines of biodiversity by 2030, which is literally just around the corner, which is a commitment that the government has made. You know, we need to actually come together in coalitions at a landscape scale to really achieve this. So we're interested in how we can develop those coalitions um, at the, at the landscape scale with other partners, with other major landowners, but also with local authorities and with, with communities. So we can actually turn the dial on the quantity, quality, and connectivity of habitats. And you can, you know, we're, we're sort of floating the idea of nature enterprise zones, and you could have a variety of crit criteria for those. It could be where we own a chunk of land. We could use our nature accelerators as sort of focal points from which we build out, but that, that's not necessary. Um, the main thing are willing partners, other landowners, other NGOs, regulatory bodies, local authorities. Um, and we, we are starting to think about this as part of developing our next tra strategy for the National Trust from 2025 to 2035. So um, I've talked about these three elements, and once again, I sort of think bringing these three elements, that what the National Trust has to offer, access and renew, um, we, we really have a chance to uh, make some major change, really identify system actors for system change, really create new partnerships at a landscape scale. But there's um, a fourth uh, uh, sort of... Player I would like to bring into the room as well. And, you know, quite often, um, particularly uh, in, in the context of uh, um, natural science expertise, quite often I, I find that society is represented as a, as a bit of a barrier. We have to persuade people to take on new technologies or we have to persuade people to do things differently. Um, and, but actually, I think that that is so much not the case. It's not about persuasion. It's about engagement. And I'd like to talk to you about um, the national conversation that we have started to really engage the wider public um, in uh, nature renewal. This is uh, something in collaboration with RSPB and the uh, WWF. started last year with... Uh, a kind of virtual consultation where we asked people these four questions. What do you love about nature? What would you miss? In 2050, what, what you know, if, if nature is thriving, what is it that you see that's different from now? And also really trying to tap into what's already um, going on to protect nature in the UK. And we got over um, 30,000 responses. Um, and this was really phase one of the national conversation. And 
Then phase two was that um, 103 people were uh, uh, selected, um, they applied and were, were selected to actually create the People's Assembly um, for Nature, which was really about sort of generating a public mandate for what, what we need to do now. And this was quite a commitment on their part. Uh, they, they met over the course of four weekends. Two of those were in person and two were virtual. Listen to 40 speakers, um, and out of this has come the People's uh, Plan for Nature. This was overseen by an independent uh, steering group, advisory group, uh, led by Pete Smith and Natalie Seddon from Aberdeen and Oxford, and various other people drawn from a variety of organisations, including youth organisations, um, uh, the CLA, the NFU, also actually someone from MasterChef who is now a, um, a restaurateur. Uh, and so these people actually guided the whole process independently. So the NGOs who'd set this up were doing this at arm's length. And they heard from a whole variety of people, you know, including people like Tony Juniper, John Lawton, um, and by the end of weekend three, they'd heard from this list of people, not just academics, not just NGOs, also farmers, consultants, government, local authorities, a water company, um, a supermarket, and so on. And out of that has come the People's Plan for Nature, which um, I mean, all the material actually that they heard is on, on the website. You can actually download and listen to all the talks that they um, heard as well. So it's a very transparent process. And in this plan, there are a number of vision statements, and there are 26 calls to action that are grouped into um, eight themes. And I just want to talk about a couple of those themes now, and some of the ways in which uh, we're working to respond um, to that mandate. Um, for example, um, the, one of the themes was nature-friendly farming. Um, and there were calls to really uh, develop farming subsidies in a different way and really inspire more farmers to ne take a nature-friendly approach. Now, this is something we're really, you know, we're very interested um, in, in uh, the National Trust. Uh, um, but, you know, we're trying, how do you actually go about this effectively at scale? Well, we campaign for the appropriate financial incentives to try to influence policy. Um, but what about supporting disruptors to start a movement? This is one, um, uh, one sort of pathway that is, is quite popular with some people. Or do you influence the mainstream to sort of move the mean or just do all of the above? Um, so, in some ways, of course, we're trying to do all of the above. For example, uh, Wild Farmed, the leader of Wild Farmed is one of our um, tenants at Buscott and Coles Hill, Andy Cato, and he's sort of leading a, um, a new uh, movement to uh, uh, really focus on improving soil health and farming in a, a very different way, which really involves intercropping, um, and actually integrating grazing animals wherever appropriate, and actually creating something that's, you know, a, a food system that's very traceable from the field to the plate, so that consumers can really participate um, in uh, supporting what he's doing. And here are some examples. I mean, he, he has now a, a number, uh, you, know, some, you know, around 70 at least, uh, other farmers involved in his network, and it's growing all the time. But here are some examples of approaches that are being developed. We've got here a case study in North Devon where we've got a, a wheat and <coughs> beans by crop. And then we've got another example here in Leicestershire, which is uh, winter wheat drilled into white clover. Now, these, these systems are um, quite 
quite complex, and it's, it's conceivable that that could be um, a barrier to their take-up. And this actually um, is a, a very beautiful picture of, of Andy Cato's um, barley field, which is intercropped with, I think, red clover and, and gazalia. And he integrates livestock into that system uh, when he can. So there's a kind of before and after. So that's one way. Support the Andy Catos of this world. Uh, um, and in fact, uh, there is a very good YouTube clip of how to, to start a movement where you have someone dancing like a loon in a festival. I'm not going to act it out. And, <laughs> and eventually... You know, other people join in. Um, so support the disruptors, uh, uh, support them to start a movement. Um, but there is also a, 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 there are other avenues that we're trying to develop. Um, and again, this is a partnership that both Matt and Rich Wielden have had a real hand in developing. And there's going to be a soft launch soon. But I hope I've managed to erase. Uh, it's meant to be confidential at the moment, so if, I, if you ac accidentally see the name of the retailer here, try and forget it, please. Um, but we're working with a major retailer uh, about creating a, a, a partnership where uh, you have a, a direct relationship with our, our tenants. Uh, in return, for uh, they become kind of part of a, a club as a result of doing certain things, like setting aside 10% of their productive land for nature restoration um, and to reduce carbon emissions um, and various other elements that sort of built into this. And in return, they then have access to this kind of premium um, market. So I think, you know, that, again, could be is, is a kind of an alternative way of trying to go with perhaps more the mainstream, but really, uh, you know, move the mean there. So that's, uh, that's uh, you know, nature-friendly farming. How do we actually move that forward? Uh, and a, a second call to action is the local access to nature. And they, um, the People's Plan for Nature came up with, I think 12% is, sounds like rather an exact amount, but I think the idea was that, you know, um, they started off at 50%. And then they realised that was way too much. They went down to 25, and then they halved it again, which is why they ended up at 12% of all space in new built infrastructure and retrofits should be supporting biodiversity. And this very interesting idea that the recognition of access to nature as a human right. And, I mean, actually that is really interesting because if you go back to the reasons why the National Trust was founded in the first place, it was very much around... Um, uh, Octavia Hill's kind of quote uh, that uh, access to space um, and green spaces and air and nature is some, a basic human need that everybody, everybody needs. So nature is not just a rural issue, it is also very much an urban issue. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is developing an urban program um, where we're working with various city councils. Actually, we have a very successful relationship in Plymouth, um, but here is one that's kind of under development in Birmingham where, quite shockingly, if you actually look at the average life expectancy in different wards across Birmingham, you compare the, the best and the, and the worst, you have... 10 years difference in average life expectancy. Um, so it's really about uh, working with a Birmingham City Council uh, to sort of develop uh, better access for nature across this part of, of East Birmingham. Um, so it's really about making the economic case to invest in improving access to nature because if you actually, uh, you know, if this is done effectively, it will benefit not just the people, but it will benefit the businesses and the local economy in that part of the city. Um, and really, you know, developing green skills and jobs and sharing learning and resources. 
but also, you know, it, we, we are thinking about how you can actually integrate environmental factors into the, um, I've got to get this right, the MID, the, uh, let me, IMD, the, oh, I was on the previous slide. <laughs> yeah, indices of multiple deprivation, that's right. So how do you actually integrate environmental factors more effectively into indices of multiple deprivation? And, you know, this gives rise to a whole host of questions about how do we actually design places to be truly welcoming and inclusive? How do we actually co-create and co-manage nature urban places with the power given to the most relevant people so that they genuinely manage them, cherish them themselves and use them themselves? And what are the social and cultural barriers to really uh, making this happen? Um, and a whole host of questions which I would, you know, I'd be, I just think it would be fantastic if Access could look at um, the people's plan for nature and really identify where uh, social science expertise could really help um, deliver those calls for action. So I'm going to do something I don't normally do, which is end with a very uh, short video clip, because this is always bound to go wrong. Um, and indeed, where is the arrow to actually get this to start? Um, so does anyone have any technical... There's a little camera down on the left. Oh. I've no idea if that will work, Rosie. No, I don't think it has. <laughs> might not allow it. Actually, if you click on it now, then you can just do it in the... Okay, because we're showing it on Zoom. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Okay. I knew this was a bad idea. Do you have a link to the video, obviously, on the internet? Because we could put that in the chat online. Yes. And then you could take us out of the PowerPoint and just show us online here in real time. On the website. Okay. Trevor, <laughs> 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 um, in the interest of time, yeah. shall we? I don't, I don't know if it's, uh, if you want to get this organised. Shall we? No, no. You should move on. You should get move some on. questions for you yeah. first. Okay. You can start it out. Yeah, well, yeah. While we get yeah. some questions, Just let's right. do an applause first. <laughs> Yeah, just, just, just come up. Yeah. Oh, challenges. Just wait for the green. Okay. It won't take long. There we go. Right, okay. We've got a question on that. Thank you. So, Ro um, yeah, Rosie, um, Yvonne Leslie has asked, nature accelerators, would it be possible to get more detail on the two locations in Northern Ireland, Belfast and East Down? Um, Well, the easiest way, actually, is to sort of... Do, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, is, is for us to do, to do that offline. Um, but, you know, actually, these nature accelerators are at different stages in their journeys. Um, uh, but we could easily, you know, we could connect people with, with the relevant uh, teams. But I know in Northern Ireland, in one case, what, uh, I can't remember which one it is. One is quite advanced in the plans, and the other one is not. Um, but yes, do contact me offline. Are you happy to put email? Yes, yes. Perfect. Any, oh, more questions. Like, who was first? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a great talk, Rosie. And I'd like to start off by congratulating uh, both you and Matt, who's next to me, uh, for uh, really making the, uh, 
uh, the National Trust a major player in this area. I think you're doing a... V oh, sorry, all right. Yeah, I, my name's Ian Bateman, and I work here at Exeter um, in a group called the Land, Environment, Economics and Policy um, Institute. Um, so I think you're doing a, gr a great job, and I wish more... Um, uh, NGOs uh, and, and groups like yourself were doing the same thing. But nevertheless, I think that is um, uh, still a challenge, not really a challenge for groups like National Trust, but certainly for policy makers with regard to nature-friendly farming. And, and that is that uh, the idea of... Um, Typically, uh, for example, reducing inputs, um, perhaps uh, taking some uh, small areas, um, maybe around fields and that sort of stuff, out of production is great for those species that can survive on it. You know what's coming, <laughs> I can tell. Um, but, of course, many of our most threatened species can't live in those environments. They need large, contiguous, really natural environments. Um, and what's more, the more we go into that sort of um, version of, of nature-friendly farming, the more that we uh, actually take land out of production and, and reduce um, food output. Now, that, that is actually a problem because it has no connection with the amount of food that people eat, particularly in a rich country like this. So we just import more. I'm not against imports at all. But unfortunately, these particular imports, um, a, a lot of them come from very fragile environments, which displace uh, some of the world's most threatened biodiversity. <clears throat> what do you think, not National Trust, I don't think this is your problem, but what do you think policymakers and society should be doing about that problem? Two things, I suppose, I, I, at least, but, you know, uh, two things I would start off with. Uh, one is we need to eat less meat, and actually in, in the People's Plan for Nature, that is one of the things they talk about. Uh, it was talked about in uh, Henry Dimbleby's report on a potential food strategy, uh, but relatively little has been done about it, and it seemed to be a contentious issue. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is we need to understand the indirect effects of the choices that we make. Uh, and it's not, you know, it's not just food. It's also all the retail, all the purchasing decisions that we make. And actually one of the case studies within Renew is that, that we're work uh, um, academics at Exeter are working with the National Trust to actually look at the biodiversity footprint of the kind of commercial side of our operation as well. So, you know, then we can really do a heat map to identify those hot spots um, so that we can, we can do interventions that should reduce our indirect impact. So there are two things. And actually, part, you know, Renew wants to actually produce the tools that will help businesses do that more effectively. But yes, that's, there are two things I would suggest. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm ever so sorry. We are 10 minutes behind time. Our break has now finished. Um, so um, I'm, I'm, please contact Rosie directly. Have a chat with her at the break. Uh, I'm sure she'd be happy to have endless conversations and ideas of burning questions here. Um, but let's thank Rosie now. And we can make, maybe we can share the link to the, the video. Well, I think it's... You know, on, if you go to the website, you can find it. It's okay. only three minutes long, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Let's uh, let's thank Rosie again. Thank you very much. Thank you.